So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. 
sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making itong bigyan din ng kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research References for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpkey is here for you. Serpkey is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and other visual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Therapy now. Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. 
two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mamabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making ipang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we tackle development issues based on data and evidence. We trust that all of you are safe and in good health. I am Sheila CR, and I will be your moderator. It has been nearly two years since the COVID-19 pandemic hit the Philippines. The pandemic has left a deep scar in our society and economy that analysts predict will take many years to heal. One of the devastating impacts of the pandemic is on the health and well-being of our citizens. But the question is, do we know or do we, do we have full extent of the COVID-19's health impacts? This afternoon, we will learn about the direct and indirect consequences of the pandemic, 
how it disrupted the delivery of essential health services in the country and the most affected groups. To officially open our event, I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me begin uh, by acknowledging the following who choose to be with us this afternoon. From the government, we have uh, Department of Agrarian Reform Undersecretary Virginia Urugo, uh, Philippine Guarantee Corporation Senior Vice President Nelia Uandasan, House of Representative Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department Director General Romero Miral Jr., uh, Senate Economic Planning and Office Director Cerces Nitafan, Banco Central ng Pilipinas Senior Director Maria Teresa Duenas, National Economic and Development Authority Director Gerli Casimiro Igtibin and Regional Director Agnes Spinas Tolentino, Office of the Ombudsman Assistant Ombudsman Leilani Bernadette Cabras, Deputy Ombudsman for Mindanao Director uh, Marco Anac Anaclito Buena, Ombudsman Director Snili Buigin Goles, Maria Olivia Elena Rojas, Maria Hanina Hidalgo, Ombudsman Acting Director Sara Jo Vergara, Ana Bilin Ronquillo, and OIC Director Rodura Galicia. Uh, Bureau of Local Government Finance Acting Director, uh, Regional, Acting Regional Director Maria Rodura Gascon, Department of Foreign Affairs Acting Director Mikal de Jos, uh, Department of Science and Technology Food and Nutrition Research Institute Deputy Director Anthony Calibo, Security and Exchange Commission Assistant Director Noe Bin uh, Ermitano, Tariff Commission Director Maria Lourdes Saluta, Governance Commissions for Geosis Acting Director Catherine Lourdes Sariaga, uh, Philippine Children's Medical Center OIC Executive Director Sonia Gonzalez, Food and Drug Administration OIC Director Irene Proletino Parinias. From the local government, we have Malipot Albay Municipal Mayor Ruli Volante. From the private sector, we have Philippine National Bank, Philippine Vice Pre uh, First Vice President Ruina Magpayo, In One Go Technologies Incorporated President Ramon Garcia, CEO Doc Chief Executive Officer Noel Del Castillo, Negros Polymedic Hospital Chief Executive Officer Clifton Co, uh, Golden Press Chief Executive Officer Maria Bilen Lim. Good Thinking Research Incorporated Director Anna Mayor, Sumiso Motor Finance Corporation Incorporated Independent Board Director Conrado Rojas. From the academy, let me acknowledge the following Cagayan State University President Orduha Alvarado, Southern Luzon State University President Dorisi Solitas Nantes, Silimani University Vice President for Finance and, Ad and Administration Jenny Chu. Uh, University of the Philippines Virata School of Business Dean Joel Tan Torres, Mariano Marcos State University Dean Ricardo Guanzon, University of the Philippines Los Banos Director Jain uh, Reyes, and Polytechnic University of the Philippines Director Marilyn Isip, De La Salle uh, Medical and Health Sciences Institute Director Diana Dalisay Urolfo, Central Philippine University Director Ami Castigador. Far Eastern University Director Desire Chungson, Cavite State University Director Orlando de los Reyes, St. Luke College of Medicine Director Renzo Ginto, Foundation University Director uh, Romario Ibanez, Northern Iloilo Polytechnic State College Batad Campus Associate Director Eva Montero. From the CSOs, NGOs, and IGOs, we have Institute of Corporate Directors Trustee Alfredo Pascual. Asian Development Bank Consultants Eduardo Dulay, Lovlian Tolin, Ma Marifilo Bacati, and Donafi Bajaro. Uh, Association of Respiratory Care Practitioner Philippines, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Cesar Bugasoyin, Sian, si Bugao Sian, San, sorry. A Small and Business Research and Development Foundation Trustee, Tony, Cal uh, Tony Calinos. Campif President Luther Calderon. Ibon Foundation Executive Director, Sunny Africa, Masaganang Sakhani Incorporated Director, Daniel Agustin, Save the Children Foundation Director, Celia Francisco, Samahan na Kabataang Voluntaryo ng Pilipinas, Deputy Regional Director, Albert Lee, and UAC 
Office of Population Studies Foundation Incorporated Director, Nanit Mayol. Let me greet our friends from the media. And finally, let me also greet our friends uh, uh, and colleagues uh, from the government, academic, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching to the PIDS and SERP uh, Facebook pages. 20 months have passed since the first case of the COVID-19 was recorded in the Philippines and continue to see and experience the devastating impact of the pandemic. What do the latest figures say about the health crisis? Checking the John Hopkins University uh, COVID-19 dashboard this morning, the COVID confirmed cases uh, have already reached more than 254 million globally. And the number of confirmed deaths is already over 5 million. The same website also showed that more than 7 billion vaccination doses have been administered worldwide. In the Philippines, the website showed that there has have been over 2.8 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and over 46,000 recorded deaths. It's also reported that a total of 71.6 million uh, vaccine doses have already been administered. While there has been a decline in the cases of coronavirus infections in the country, the Philippines remains at the bottom of the Bloomberg's uh, latest COVID-19 resilience ranking covering 53 countries as of its October 27, 2021 report. This is the second time the Philippines ranked lowest. The first was in September this year. Nikkei Asia's latest COVID-19 recovery index dated September 30, 2021 also showed the Philippines at the bottom of 121 countries included. The recovery index assesses infection management, vaccine rollout, and social mobility. As we enter the recovery phase, it is crucial to have a clear picture of the effects of the pandemic on our health sector to identify what strategies work and did not work and areas for improvement. In addition, knowing the current status would help the government recalibrate and reform its systems and tools to prepare for and prevent outbreaks of similar magnitude in the future. This afternoon, Dr. Barrio, Valerie Go Gilbert Olip will share his study titled The Broader Impacts of the COVID-19 Pandemic. The study look at the current state of the health services in the country and the estimated uh, economic costs, estimated economic cost of, pandem of the pandemic on health. It also examined consultation and admissions data from selected pub public primary health care facilities and hospitals. Finally, it analyzed the productivity losses due to premature deaths and disabilities from COVID-19 and non-COVID uh, cases. We hope that this study will further stimulate debates on developing a more holistic and calibrated public health response to the pandemic. We invited discussions for the Department of Health and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation to give us more insights. I want to thank Mr. Christian Edward Nuevo, Supervising Health Program Officer at the DOH Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, and Dr. Lambert David, Acting Senior Manager of the Field Health Standards and Monitoring Departments for taking their time to be with us this afternoon. To our viewers, I look forward to your active participation during the Often Forum. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Have a good day. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Orbeta. So uh, before we proceed to the presentation, allow me to remind you about our house rules for those who are joining us uh, for the first time, or um, or if you, in case you miss uh, the recording um, on the house rules, which we played before we started the webinar. So to join the open forum, just use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen and uh, type there your question and send it to all panelists or to everyone and not to a particular person. I will read your question your questions during the open forum. And since we have limited time, please make your questions concise. Then for our uh, viewers on uh, Facebook, you are also welcome to participate in our conversation. Just type your question in the comment section and I will read up to uh, two questions during the open forum, okay? So uh, also a gentle reminder on uh, the time allocation for all our speakers for Okay, for our uh, presenter, uh, up to 30 minutes, and uh, for all the discussions, up to 15 minutes each, okay? 
So at this point, I, I now invite all of you to pay attention to our featured uh, study for this webinar. And to present the study is uh, the author himself, Dr. Valerie Gilbert Ulep, uh, who is a senior research fellow at PIDS. He is currently the director of the Institute's research projects on health and nutrition. He is also a senior researcher at the Ateneo School of Government. And prior to joining PIDS, he worked, he worked at the World Bank and its uh, DC and Delhi offices. He was a doctoral fellow at the University of Toronto Center for Global Health Research, where he conducted economic studies on tobacco taxes. He also served as a consultant at the World Bank the Asian Development Bank, the World Health Organization, the Center for Global Development, and US, USAID. He is a recipient of various awards, including the Nikkei Asia and Emerging Voices for Global Health. Dr. Ulip holds a PhD in, in Health Economics from Canada and a Master's Degree in Epidemiology. Dr. Val Ulip, the floor is now yours. So thank you, Sheila. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. So, so hi there. Firstly, uh, I would like to um, thank my. I would I would like to thank my colleagues at PIDS for for mounting this event, and I also want to mention that the finding of these various studies are group efforts of our very young, dynamic, and uh, very competent health team at PIDS. Uh, namely Jana Uwe Lalcases and uh, some of our consultants. And of course, our friends um, friends and collaborators in the Department of Health, in NEDA, and Center for Global Development in DC. So the, the motivation of this public seminar is basically twofold. So first, um, we want to basically unfold a looming public health crisis. Um, the impact of the pandemic on on both COVID and non-COVID patient is very extreme. Uh, but in terms of the indirect effects or impact on non-COVID patient, it's barely discussed, right? So it's, it's critical that someone needs to actually examine and tell the other side of the story. And the second um, motivation is we want to start conversations, right? Within the government and within the public sphere about um, the, broad, the broader health impact of the pandemic, both direct and indirect to achieve a well-informed, calibrated public health response. I, I think one of the narr narratives that we've heard throughout the pandemic is the oversimplification of the issue. Um, but COVID in itself is a very complex problem that requires complex solution. And whether we like it or not, this will entail a lot of challenging trade-offs, right? And to say that you know, we only need four to five simple things to overcome this pandemic could be very harmful and misleading, if, if you ask me. So, but whatever policy choices in the country will have a very tremendous repercussion. So we are left with no choice but to assess uh, the different trade off of different policy approaches. So hence it's important for us to understand the total harm um, on health caused by the pandemic. So the title of my presentation is the multifaceted health impacts of, of, of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So next slide, please. So in the Philippines, um, measuring total harm caused by the pand pandemic, uh, when we're doing this study is very challenging. In terms of the direct impact, it might not be perfect, but the government has built an entire health information system that regularly monitors um, COVID cases, um, hospitalization cases, or death on a daily basis. I've been working uh, uh, with the health sector for a few years, uh, understanding the data system for a long time. And in fairness, and I must say this, that building a health, a health information system during the pandemic for a short period, um, given the country's fragmented healthcare system and limited capacity, right, uh, at the local level, is already a great feat, right? But, but for a long time, even before the pandemic, real-time disease surveillance has been a major, major challenge. A lot of you are working in the health sector, and we know this. Um, this is not a problem of the, ad, the current administration alone, but this has persisted for a long time. 
um, it cut across governments and, dif uh, and different administrations, right? Uh, we don't know what's happening uh, um, in many hospitals and rural health units. The, the death and cases related to COVID that we see every day barely reflects the total harm caused by the pandemic. Um, without any health information that allows us to measure what happened to, you know, cardiovascular diseases, uh, how, what happened to a pregnant women in a, in a far-flung area, and other indirect health effects, they are usually gone unmeasured, right? They, we don't know what happened, what happened to them during the height of the pandemic. And as they say, you know, um, um, if you are, un if, if, the, if a particular event is unmeasured, they will never be unmanaged. They will never be managed. So for us, um, um, it, it is important to think, therefore, um, um, measuring uh, um, the indirect effects of, of, of health uh, of, of the pandemic. Next slide. So I just want to uh, mention that most of the, the findings of this study were lifted from various studies by the health team at PIDS. Uh, um, we examined the deterioration of field health claims uh, for high burden conditions during the pandemic. Um, uh, they, they, they are published at PIDS website in, in Lancet Regional Health and Center for Global Development. So um, if you want to read more about the methods and the more detailed analysis, you can check it. They are all open access. So I would not go through all the, the details of the methodology in this presentation, but the, just the, the gist of this finding uh, of, these, of, of these studies. Next slide. Um, I just want to show you this, I think, a very important framework that basically guided our, our analysis or, our, or, or the narrative of this paper. So this just basically shows you the framework uh, that we, we use to examine the indirect health effects right, of the pandemic and how the general health system is typically or usually uh, disrupted because of the pandemic and the associated policy response to it. So in general, the pandemic and the policy approaches to mitigate the spread of the virus, basically disrupted the supply ecosystem of the health system. Supply side meaning um, the funding mechanisms, the supply chain, um, the health workforce that are restricted and reallocated to, to COVID response. So these disruptions will impact the delivery of traditional public health programs like maternal and child health services, non-communicable diseases, uh, um, immunization, etc. And the poor uptake of these services have a very um, uh, long-term, have a short, medium, and long-term impact that, enormous, that, that, that are very costly. For example, uh, the short-term uh, impact would be, you know, unattended emergencies, right? Uh, in many other countries, in African countries, they've seen increase in infant mortality rates, but we don't know yet if we are seeing that pattern, right? In the medium term, um, we see uh, poor adherence to medicine, like you know, rise of drug resistant uh, uh, um, uh, uh, infection, right? And other disease outbreaks. For example, in the UK, they've seen um, increase in cases for uh, RSV or respiratory syncytial virus because in children, right? Um, and, of, and of course, the long term impact, right? The chronic malnutrition. Um, um, there is expected increase in stunting rates in the medium to long term. And more interestingly, uh, these implications has huge um, uh, equity uh, angle, right? In other countries, this impact has severely impacted the most vul uh, vulnerable population. We've seen higher rates among the poor or among women, among children. So we expect that that will also be the case in, in, in the Philippines. So next slide. So why it matters to think about the indirect effects, right? Why the death, COVID death and death hospitalizations are not enough to measure the impact, right? Um, um, it matters because most of us working in the health sector, we know that the coverage um, uh, uh, rates of uh, key basic health indicators before the pandemic is pretty low, right? And to me, a further decline of, of these um, key uh, health indicator will be very catastrophic to population health and well-being. So, so the left side uh, just shows you the UH index in the Philippines relative to other countries. This happened before the pandemic 2017, right? 
And UHC is basically an index measuring the coverage of basic maternal and child health services and CDs and infectious diseases, right? Uh, and we know that even before the pandemic, the Philippines is lagging behind in these coverage indicators, um, even lower than, you know, relatively poorer countries like Vietnam, right? So further decline of these intervention, uh, of these coverage rates will be very catastrophic. So uh, I just gave you some examples here. Um, uh, only 50% of, of children have received prenatal care, um, uh, visited health provider, uh, because of pneumonia is 55%. We all know that our child vaccination rate is also low. Uh, uh, there's also issues in, in TB treatment coverage and ART for HIV. So, so we, 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 these indicators are relatively low compared to other uh, aspirational peers or regional peers. Um, next slide. Um, so with that, the objective of, of the study, uh, there are two objectives of the study. So number one is to demonstrate the disruption of essential healthcare services in the Philippines. And the second is to estimate the economic costs of both direct and indirect health impacts of the pandemic. Next slide. So let's just start with a, a brief overview about COVID-19 pandemic. I know everyone knows this already. So the Philippines is one of the uh, countries severely affected with COVID-19. So as uh, Dr. Orbeta said, we have recorded 2.8 million cases uh, around 45 to 46,000 deaths. Um, uh, if you look at rankings, the country ranked uh, 21st, I guess, in terms of global um, number, in terms of total death, but significantly lower when you adjust it with population size, right? Um, uh, we have around 350 deaths per, per million compared to around 650 deaths uh, at the global uh, average. So, however, in many, uh, in, uh, as, as many infection, um, COVID infection um, have gone undetected. Epidemiologic models suggest that the total infection that we are recording is around four to five times lower than the the, the uh, in infection rate, higher than the official UH tally, of course. Next slide. So, so you were using PSA or the Philippine Statistical Authority if we examine death costs by COVID-19. Um, so the, the COVID-19 uh, now accounts for around six percent of the total uh, total death in the country, um, but we ex that's for 2020. But we expect higher death toll uh, for 2021. So, for example, if you look at the uh, um, interim report for for deaths in uh, in in PID in PSA, uh, um, the total number uh, of death from June to July already accounts for 9% of the total death, right? But we, we want to uh, have this analyzed at the end of the year, but it's increasing. Um, uh, uh, or we have we recorded higher death toll uh, in 2021. Next slide. So, so in addition to death, uh, the reported death, I think excess death uh, could provide a very uh, uh, important information about the true disease burden of the pandemic. So, in just just to brief to give you a brief um, definition of terms like in epidemiology, excess death is one of the commonly used indicators uh, of the overall impact of the pandemic on disease burden or mortality. So, it includes not only the confirmed death, um, uh, but also the unconfirmed death and other de deaths uh, from indirect causes. Right. So. Uh, the figure shows that the number of deaths compared to the projected death for 2020 uh, uh, is, is much, much higher um, in, in 2021, but we don't see a conspicuous uh, um, um, excess death in 2020, um, uh, which is uh, uh, similar to the previous slide that we see more excess death in 2021 than in 2020. Um, it will be very interesting to see the cause of death that drives this increase. So in 2021, uh, most of the slight increase in excess death can be attributed, for example, to mental health, right? We see that mental health uh, mortality increased from around 2,800 uh, in 2019 to around 4,300 in, in, in 2020. So there's an increase in in uh, number of deaths uh, 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 from, I, I'm accounted uh, from from mental health, and but decrease in other uh, in other diseases. Next slide. 
uh, just to give you um, um, about just give just to give you about just just to give you a little bit of of information about um, our policies in in controlling the pandemic. So we, we all know that lockdowns has been the main the mainstay um, interventions to control the spread of the pandemic. So uh, the, the Philippines has imposed one of the strictest lockdown in in the world. So you can see here um, uh, this this figure just shows you the stringency index of the Philippines compared to our ASEAN neighbors, right? So the country has consistently recorded a high stringency index uh, since the start of the pandemic. So um, it recorded the highest stringency uh, in around March. The, the, that's the beginning of the pandemic, right? And that persisted throughout uh, 2020. So, um, but the, the social and economic and health repercussions of prolonged mobility restrictions, school closures, and border controls are costly. So therefore, um, uh, it's important for us to examine both the indirect and indirect consequences of the pandemic and the associated policy response. Next slide. So I'll just, uh, so this will be uh, the, the, the first slide uh, describing the, the findings of our different studies. So let's start describing our findings using field health claims. So, uh, but I urge you to, to read the Lancet Regional Health and CGD papers for the methodology and the detailed analysis. Um, but in this study, using field health claims of 12 high burden conditions and five major procedures, we examined the monthly claims from field health and ass assess the changes compared to the same pre period of the previous year, which is uh, 2009. So we adjusted this for seasonality, right? There might be an um, um, uh, 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 impact there. So we adjusted for seasonality. So I want you to look at the left figure. So um, uh, this is the number of claims uh, divided, uh, uh, disaggregated by medical claims and procedural claims, right? So, so when so we selected for, for medical claims, we selected twelve major condition, which accounts for about eighty percent of the total disease burden in the or sorry, it's about fifty to sixty percent of the total. Uh, disease burden of the country, meaning these are the major causes of uh, years life loss, right, uh, uh, in the Philippines. So they are uh, actually very, very important. So the claims for 12 medical claims on average declined around 50 to 60% in 2020 compared to the previous years, right? Um, the decline in procedural claims, however, is not substantial or is not, is not significant. But when you go deeper, you see very interesting patterns later. I'll describe it later. So now I want you to look at the right. So if we examine uh, the claims by disease, a lot of interesting pattern um, happens. So there's a huge heterogeneity or variation um, across diseases, right? So we, we can think of several conclusions here. So first, infection, infectious diseases and respiratory uh, conditions decline, right? So like uh, acute gastroenteritis, uh, pneumonia, COPD, suffered the largest decline around 60 to 80%. So, and again, I want to emphasize that age or acute gastroenteritis is very common in children. So a lot of children might have not, um, have gone to facility for checkups uh, related to acute gastroenteritis. Second is, while conditions or diseases that needs urgent care like cancer, chemotherapy, CKD, uh, suffered a slower decline around 20%, that, ex that is expected because it's, it's actually more urgent. Um, third is that the conditions that need maintenance like as diabetes, uh, um, uh, uh, IHD or the heart diseases uh, also declined by around 40%, right? So nonetheless, I, I think that the gist of this is that all medical claims suffered large decline and we don't see any recovery until the end of the year, uh, unlike in many countries like in the US where they see recovery in the fourth, third and fourth quarter. But for us, we've, we've sustained that low or pre, uh, very low levels of insurance claim uh, um, relative to pre-pandemic pre-pandemic period. Um, however, I want to emphasize that the procedures are highly variable. The procedural claims are highly va variable. So uh, there is a rebound in 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 cataracts cataract in December. So you see a large spike because it's an elective surgery. So in December, the the, the, the claims for cataract increase. C sections and vaginal delivery also decline. Um, um, uh, throughout the entire period. Note, however, that these are ho uh, hospital claims, so we did not examine clinics, so there might be uh, 
issues going on uh, on vaginal delivery and cesarean sections, right? Next slide. Um, the pandemic has changed the dynamics in hospital ad admissions, right? So, so we feel that a lot of hospitals are trying to be more efficient um, unconsciously or consciously. So if you examine the medical claims, there's a huge decline um, across level and types of hospitals. You see like all, like all levels you see decline, right? But in terms of in terms of procedures, important findings are unfolding. Like for example, as I've said, C-section and vaginal delivery and chemotherapy were decreasing at, in higher level facilities, but increasing lower level faci private facilities. So our hypothesis is that hospitals are unconsciously or consciously becoming more efficient. So higher level facilities are more mostly COVID referral hospitals, so they go to lower lower level facility. But again, from a fi health financing point of view, what, what would be the implications of this, right? From an economic perspective, our health economic perspective, this is actually good uh, because, for instance, you don't expect or you should you should not want a pregnant woman to get delivered in a level three specialized hospital. You want them to deliver in level one or, you know, uh, clinics, right? So there, there there is a thing going on there. There's a dynamics that we need to further understand. So. Uh, I want also to concentrate on chemotherapy. So more lower level facilities catering to, to, to chemotherapy. This is quite interesting because uh, I think the question now is, do we see more chemotherapy happening in level one hospitals and private clinics, right? So if you ask a lot of uh, doctors, they doing their uh, uh, um, chemotherapy in their clinics, right? So, so again, what will happen to the cost and, and quality, right? Uh, if we are shifting to this practice during the pandemic? So next slide. So we also tried to look at the uh, uh, the claims by May membership. So again, I think what just went, the, the gist of this slide is that the indigent members suffered the largest decline in claims. So the poor are not, now we begin to question, so the poor are not accessing health anymore, right? So, so this finding has huge equity implication. It means that the poor might have huge unmet need of healthcare uh, during the pandemic, right? So you see large decline in, 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 in their claims. Next slide. So, so that's for the insurance claims. So, but PIDS and DOH also collected data directly from hospitals. Again, we wanted to analyze this if there is a rep repository of hospital admissions and RHU consultations, but we don't in the country. So what we did is to get direct get the data directly from hospitals and rural health units to validate our analysis using field health claims so so here using admissions data from selected government hospitals you estimated that the median number of admissions by quarter and patient type adult medicine surgery pediatrics and ob uh, and if you see for adult medicine and and pediatrics the mean admission declined by 40 to 70 percent in the second quarter relative to the previous year with no signs of recovery uh, throughout the year, uh, the decline in inpatient care among children is, is uh, in pediatric is alarming, right? So, so um, again, there's no signs of recovery for, for pediatrics, for pediatric patients. But for surgery, you see a, a recovery uh, in the third and fourth quarter. Next slide. Uh, for, for, PIDS and DOH also collected data from rural health units. So the number of consultations in RHU significantly declined, particularly among vulnerable populations, right? So please note that rural health units are critical because they are the gateway of individuals and communities to the public health system. That's their umbilical cord, right? So they provide the basic healthcare services, such as nutrition interventions, maternal and child and reproductive health services, NCD services, et cetera, right? And a lot of uh, you know uh, infectious disease uh, interventions. So using data um, from RHU, we demonstrated um, decline in consultations among vulnerable population, particularly among under five and elderly. Right. And I also want to to um, to highlight that the decrease in TB dots and hypertension, which brings me to the next slide. Right. Next slide. So. We wanted to supplement the we want to supplement uh, the RHU data with the actual program data from from DOH. We got data for for TB, HIV, and other diseases. But I want I only included here uh, TB and HIV. 
So the, the coverage of critical public health programs also suffered. This is a major blow to uh, for the country's effort in achieving health system targets. So the program data from DOH um, suggests declining um, um, uh, uh, number of HIV testing, diagnosis, and treatment, uh, which is also true for TV dots. Right? I, I won't go through it, but you will see here the, the decline in, in, in these indicators. Right. So again, these are HIV and and TB are like the basic and most critical public health indicators. And if you see the large declines in this, at least to me, it's, it's alarming, right? Uh, okay, so next slide. So, so what is causing the decline in healthcare services then? So again, uh, in the paper, so we've elaborated on this. So, uh, and, and basically you can divide the, these, reasons into two, demand and supply, right? So um, so for demand, you will see um, confidence and safety. Uh, if you look at surveys, a lot of people are afraid of going to facilities, right? Uh, that's an issue. Another important thing that needs to be examined is the reduction in income. So declining income is also a critical factor, especially in a country with huge uh, or high levels of out of pocket. So in the Philippines, around 47% uh, of the Philipp of Filipinos or are using, uh, I mean, 47 of our health uh, spending uh, in the in the country accounts for out of pocket. So, so this brings me to the fact that a lot of people will say, "Oh, the, the most important thing is health," and uh, instead of the economy, this is grossly uninformed to me because health and and health indicators are tightly linked. So, if you do a basic uh, and uh, uh, back of the envelope estimate, so if the income elasticity of healthcare demand is 0.7, right? That's the usual. And if you are, if the income of households are declining by around 8%, we will see reductions in pre-pandemic hospitalization by uh, from 4.7 to 3.75%. So, when I say 4%, before pandemic, around 4% of the population are going to, uh, uh, I mean, go. Uh, 4% of the of Filipinos are hospitalized, but because of the de in decline in income, we expect around 3.5 to 3.75%. So that's a huge number when you convert that into actual number of Filipinos, right? The third demand, in, demand issue is mobility restrictions. Um, and for supply, there is, you know, the, the issues on overrun health facilities. We, we know this story. Um, uh, second is reallocation of resources. If you do KIIs with DOH, so for example, the reduction, for example, in TB dots services could be attributed to the dwindling TB supplies because of reallocation of human resources and diagnostic equipment, right, for COVID response, like the expert machines uh, for that's usually used for TB were repurposed for COVID testing. So, of course, you don't have something anymore for TB, right? So, uh, that these are some of the possible explanation why we see declining healthcare services in the Philippines. Next slide. I think I'm running out of time. So next, um, so we, we try to estimate the estimate the economic cause of both the indirect and indirect impact of the pandemic. Uh, we work together with NEDA on this. Um, but before we show the results, I want to who basically you know describe the framework uh, that I use in estimating the impact. Um, so remember, in, in many empirical studies, healthcare services directly affects health, right? So if you are building hospitals that will be affect health, right? If you're building RHU, that will be, you know, uh, that will impact health. But income as well, there is a link, um, an important link of income and health outcomes. So decrease in GDP will severely affect health and healthcare demand, right? So um, as I've said, when we say, oh, GDP declining is fine, as long as you have saved many people, it's quite dangerous. Uh, and remember the Preston curve, there is a linear relationship of GDP per capita and life expectancy. Um, and education as well, there is a direct link. So decreased schooling, like school closures will severely impact health. This is proven in many empirical studies, not only in this country, but in other, in other parts of the world. So when we say um, we just close schools, <laughs> we need to understand that there is also health implications of that, not only the, the, the loss of le uh, learning, right? But there is also huge uh, health impact of closing down schools, right? So, but again, in our study, we did not estimate the income, the impact of income on the in, in, income 
and education uh, on the on on health, the direct impact of income and health. Um, um, but based on initial estimates, the impact of school closures around 11 trillion. But for for this particular exercise, we only look at what would be the impact when when we don't access healthcare. When what would be the impact on health? But we did not assess what would be the impact of income reduction or uh, school closures, right, on health directly on health. So it's not part of the estimation. Next slide. So that's the biggest caveat, caveat for this. This is what I'm telling about. Um, this is just a uh, 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 slide showing the Preston curve. They call it the Preston curve. So that's the relationship of GDP per capita and your life expectancy. So if you decrease your GDP per capita, there will have a tremendous impact of your life expectancy. So um, um, uh, we expect that also uh, in the Philippines, as we've seen large declines in GDP per capita. Next slide. Um, sorry for the business slide, but I just want to elaborate the basic methodology in estimating the cost. So for the direct impact, we've estimated the year's life loss due to premature death because of COVID. Um, we also estimated the life, life years loss uh, because of disability, right? So, so these are our standard formulas, right? In in using global burden studies, right? Um, so for non-COVID, uh, we use the standard formula in epidemiology called the population impact fraction. So here we estimated that dallies from declining inpatient care, um, declining outpatient visits, the impact of food insecurity on stunting, um, decrease uh, TB dots. Uh, access to TB dot services, decrease in ART uh, services for HIV, increase in incidence in mental health, and declining prenatal care and child immunization and other NCD risks. So again, not all diseases are not included. So I will not go through the, the formula, but um, this is basically the, the intuition behind the estimation, right? So next slide. Um, so based on our estimates, the productivity losses because of premature death uh, and diseases because of the pandemics around 2.3 trillion. So this is a long run cost. So this is the lifetime cost. So you can see that the indirect effects for non-COVID is the driver of this cost, right? Um, um, meaning the indirect effects because of, you know, decrease in uh, access to different health services, et cetera, are basically the major driver of the, 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 the um, uh, life uh, and the years of life loss, right? Um, in this estimation. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of uh, uh, or the intuition behind in the increasing disability adjusted life years because of the deterioration of essential healthcare services. So, for example, we've, we've seen increase in food insecurity from 53 to 63 uh, percent. So, the lifetime cost is around uh, 650 billion pesos uh, of that. Um, so, for TB dots, we've seen decline from 83 to 74 percent. So the, the cost of that is around 29 billion. Um, ART is 46 to 33, so that's 16 billion. Um, but for, for fully immunized children, um, uh, if you look at the, uh, what's it again? For, according to the DOH estimates, the, um, the decline is from 69 to 64%, but there is a projection that the estimates will decline this year to 48. So assuming that, we will only vaccinate 48%. The economic cost of that is huge, around 300, uh, around 300 billion dollars, 100 billion pesos. So again, it's important for us to vaccinate children because otherwise that's that's very very costly. Next slide. Um, again, just a summary. So um, in the Philippines, inpatient care for high burden diseases sharply declined during the first year of the pandemic. So the poorest population suffered the largest decline. So children and a lot of vulnerable populations are bearing the brunt of the pandemic. Um, the number of consultation in RH significantly declined as well, particularly among the vulnerable population. Um, the coverage of critical public health programs also suffered a major, which is a major blow uh, uh, to the country's effort in achieving targets like SDG um, health system targets, right? And the, the long run productivity losses because of both direct and indirect is around 2.3 trillion in, in that present value. Next slide. So, okay, uh, I'll, I'll be quick. So I have three recommendations. Um, so the first recommendation is actually we use this opportunity to to, institu to institutionalize path-breaking reforms, right? So um, 
historically, it, it's really hard to institutionalize health reforms, but this is now the opportunity. So, for example, if you look at the socialized medicine in Western Europe and in Russia, um, these were established after the 1918 flu pandemic, and, and these systems are still enjoying this, this, this uh, uh, syst I mean, these countries are still enjoying this system. So there is a, 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 a legacy that we can actually push, which is to improve uh, reforms, right? Uh, second is to institutionalize primary care oriented and integrated healthcare systems. So many countries with strong primary care somehow uh, have better COVID response. Um, number three is adapt massive capital investments through adoptions of the health facility enhancement program, right? So in the Philippines, the number of beds is one per 1,000, uh, uh, which is similar to a lot of sub-Saharan African countries. We are transitioning to become an upper middle income countries, but the number of beds in the Philippines is similar to the poorest countries in Africa, right? So this is, that's alarming. So based on our modeling exercise, we need 2.5 per 1,000, similar to many upper middle income countries. And we aspire to be that in the next what? In the ne next year, in the next two years. So we need to double the number of beds. So with 1,000 beds, even a slight increase in COVID, <laughs> your hospitals is already full. So, and, and, and that is the major thing that we need. We need more investments in, 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 in health facilities, right? Uh, in the health facility development program, we've elaborated how the private sector, government sector can participate, but uh, it's not the, the arena to discuss that, but there is huge opportunity for us to, to do more investments in, in facilities, right? But again, the number of doubling the number of beds um, entails not capital investments alone, but this should be complemented with HR reforms and, and governance reforms, right? So um, I just want to reinforce that. Next slide. I think this is my second to the last. So again, invest mostly in, in health information system. Um, implement standardized and non-fragmented electronic medical record in health facilities. I've heard, you've, you've heard many times this recommendation because this is very critical to allow quick and survey, quick surveillance and ability to monitor and evaluate programs. So how do we do this, right? So how we need to link, we need to change how we, we, we pay the providers, link compliance to financing reforms, link it to governance reform with DOH, right? So, and, you know, example of that will be provision of grants, et cetera, right? So again, it's not the arena, but there are mechanisms for, for us to force, somehow force, uh, uh, health facilities to adapt uh, a standardized electronic medical records. If we have this, we don't need to collect data from hospitals and check, oh, bumababa yung cases natin for cardiovascular disease. If we just have that surveillance system, right? Um, and uh, again, incentivize the use of telemedicine. Uh, there are many uh, on, on how do we do that? You know, innovative financing. Um, how do we pay actually um, uh, telemedicine? So it's not it's not clear yet. Like, what would be the role of field health in telemedicine, right? So, and sh but of course, we also need to do a lot of homeworks on how do we ensure quality standards, right? Uh, in, when implementing telemedicine, and a lot of uh, a lot of um, accountability mechanisms, right? Uh, when we implement uh, telemedicine. Uh, next slide. I think this is my last slide. Um, again, there needs to be. Um, whether we like it or not, there is a growing consensus among ac academics that the COVID-19 will be here to stay. Um, and elimination might, might not be seen in the, in the next few years. It might, it might not be even possible. And as we expect the virus to be endemic, I don't know what that means, but, but the country needs to slowly transition, transition its governance structure of COVID response um, and include it in the country's public health program. You know, um, similar to how we control TB, HIV, or NCDs. Um, but I think this is the best strategy. How do we transition? How do we, how, do we, how do we think of COVID similar to TB or similar to HIV? Um, uh, well, I really don't know, um, but, but needs to be, this needs to be examined and, and studied carefully. Um, and we need to make sure that when we address or control or prevent COVID, it needs to be uh, holistically in parallel with other programs in the Department of Health, uh, again, like TB, HIV, and CD, right? So um, if you ask me, I, I don't know how to answer this, but I, I guess this is the right direction. And many countries are now embracing this kind of transition. 
um, and I I think that's my last slide. So um, that's it. So many thanks again for for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Val Ule, for your uh, insightful and comprehensive presentation. Uh, actually, I like I like your use of an iceberg as a metaphor. No, uh, I think that this was in the early part of your presentation. You use an iceberg to uh, describe the hidden cost of the pandemic, and indeed, uh, what we're what we're seeing now is just the tip of the iceberg. And thanks to your presentation, which I consider a seminal study we now have a, a, a clear and uh, more uh, comprehensive picture of the pandemic's health effect impacts, okay? So let's um, continue our conversation. And this time we will hear from our invited experts uh, on their insights, uh, insights on uh, the study's findings and recommendations. Our conversation will not be complete without the Department of Health and we're honored to have with us uh, Mr. Christian Nuevo, um, Supervising Health Program Officer at the uh, Disease Prevention and Control Bureau of DOH. His work centers on the implementation of the Universal Health Care Act, particularly as it relates to strengthening of primary care and its delivery uh, reforms and transition in health financing and integration of governance and support mechanisms such as information systems and procurement and supply chain. He previously worked as a research fellow at the research division of the DOH Health Policy Development and Planning Bureau. Uh, he led, he also led both the health financing and universal health care research and policy study groups that provided technical guidance on health financing reforms and the already legislated UHCF. He has provided uh, technical assistance to projects of development partners such as the UNICEF, World Health Organization, World Bank, ADB, UNFPA, and was health financing expert of ThinkWell Philippines. He earned his double degree in health sciences and development studies from the Ateneo de Manila University and is currently completing his master's in development economics at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Mr. Christian Nuevo, uh, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so on behalf of the DOH, I would like to thank PIDS for allowing us the opportunity to participate. Um, and of course, I see a lot of uh, familiar names on the list, uh, esteemed colleagues and mentors from the academe, other government institutions, the private sector, etc. Uh, so thank you very much for allowing us this platform. So indeed, it is a very timely discussion that we're having this that we're having um, this afternoon as we move towards uh, quote unquote recovery from this pandemic. So the past few years, it cannot be denied that really COVID has practically taken over our lives. Uh, but COVID for so long has been viewed largely within its confines. But as what Dr. Val Uleb said earlier during his opening, it really has a wave of repercussions on a host of other things both direct and indirect to health. So I guess after that initial shock to the system coming into the um, initial phases of the pandemic, now looking back, we kind of have perfect vision to things that have already happened. And right now with the DOH, we are striving towards improving internally our systems to improve the service delivery as we go along and also anticipate future challenges that may be similar to this. So what I will try to do for my response is to kind of go through each of the recommendations that Dr. Ulep mentioned and highlight some existing initiatives of the DOH that are relevant to these. So we are actually very happy and very affirmed that a lot of these recommendations are in line with what we actually want to happen also at the DOH. So the first one being investing more in health facilities and capacities, which include human resources. So I think if we can all look back at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the biggest challenges really was the lack of needed infrastructure. We had to scale up our testing really, really fast. And eventually we had to put up more beds to make sure that we cater to more inpatient cases. So it really was an infrastructure problem. And if we look at the experiences of other countries, some of them were able to respond quickly because they had previous infrastructure investments coming from other pandemics. So they were able to activate these resources and respond swiftly 
to the COVID-19 pandemic, but, but we didn't have this luxury, right? But now moving forward, we bring this knowledge with us. And as the DOH pushes forward with its plans, for example, the Philippine Health Development, uh, Health Facility Development Plan, which was mentioned by Val earlier, that really moves towards expanding infrastructure capacity. And the targets are exactly as what Val mentioned, double the inpatient bed capacity in coming years. So with that comes expanding also our human resource base. So thank you to the Universal Healthcare Act. We are able to institutionalize new mechanisms such as the National Health Workforce Support System, the National Health Workforce Registry, which will allow us more visibility to the inventory of health human resource that we have and see how we can mobilize these in times of greater need. And I think one of the biggest reforms also in human resources is really the push for primary care. And right now we're starting to institutionalize a certification mechanism for primary care providers. And I say this with emphasis to the second recommendation that was uh, provided by Dr. Val Ulep also, pushing for a stronger primary care. So we agree very much that in hindsight, if we had been supported by a stronger primary care, our households, our individuals um, had definitive linkages to primary care providers, things probably would have been a lot easier, correct? So it would have been easier to cascade important health information, to roll out our vaccines, to keep tabs of people for contact tracing, and even to navigate our um, Filipinos who need healthcare to isolation units or to hospitals when needed. So uh, primary care really could have been strong ammunition for us. And moving forward, this is a huge priority of the organization, not just of TOH, but even of PhilHealth. So with PhilHealth, we're working towards developing the comprehensive outpatient benefit package to really strengthen coverage for primary care. And even us here within the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, we're moving towards an integrated approach already. So we're moving away from the verticalized programmatic thinking to a life stage approach to really integrate primary care as part of the core of service delivery. Um, aside from this, we also agree very much with the need for investment in information system. So disease surveillance has long been a problem of the sector and it has gone through decades of, of, of attempts to improve it, but um, there's still lots to do. Uh, again, in hindsight, if we had strong information system, perhaps we didn't even have to put up new systems for contact tracing, for case detection, even for our vaccination certification. Things could have been streamlined right from the very beginning. So that's where we're headed. We're also institution uh, institutionalizing new initiatives to integrate, for example, our multiple information system. So we have multiple disease registries right now, multiple, multiple databases, and we want to move away from that. In fact, the very bold vision right now in terms of information system is to move towards line listing and passive data collection, meaning getting information straight from facilities. So the idea here is to lessen the burden of our providers to work with singular platform for information system and not have uh, separate registries to manage and actually get information from the field real time. But of course, there's lots of adjustments that will need to happen here, both in terms of software and hardware investments. Um, but it definitely is also one of the bigger priorities of the uh, DOH um, to really strengthen our capacity. And on the last note, the last recommendation, uh, definitely there, really is, there is already thinking of how we can transition COVID-19 to regular programming. So Definitely, it's here to stay uh, in the foreseeable future, although fingers crossed that hopefully elimination can still happen, but it's here to stay um, in the foreseeable future. So we need to be able to integrate COVID-19 to normal programming. So in service delivery, we've mentioned already stronger primary care, but actually even for treatment and management, how do we fit all of these in a life stage approach, right? Um, what will be the effective treatment guideline for pediatric cases and for adult cases? And really see treatment and management of the disease as age cohorts so that we are able to keep track with how they progress later on in years. And of course, support systems also will be part of the transition. So aside from information systems, we also are institutionalizing reforms in procurement and logistics management 
we're shifting towards automated logistics management, um, pooled procurement even to help LGUs acquire the resources that they need. If we look back, a lot of the issues on the ground, for example, on testing was the difficulty in getting the supplies and reagents needed for testing. So a pooled procurement facility can probably help address that and allow the sector better affordability. And lastly, our favorite, minimum public health standards. The vision really is to integrate it as part of healthy setting initiatives, right? So to really be consistent in making sure that our schools are safe, our other public luxury places are safe, and maybe institutionalize some form of accreditation to really show the public which areas are safe for us to go. And I think I would just like to extend it further outside recommendations for health. Maybe we can also look into non-health interventions. And I emphasize this because the presentation of Dr. Ulep highlighted that the experience with the pandemic really showed how health affects other sectors and how other sectors also affect health. So for example, he said, um, he shared some data about socioeconomic factors affecting access to health. Our poorer households have the greatest decrease in claims for inpatient care. And also our mobility restrictions, how it translated to transportation restrictions, which eventually led to foregone care. So there really is a need to institutionalize stronger social protection and safety nets so that people don't fear not going to work and taking care of themselves first um, in facing extraordinary circumstances like this. So moving forward, there really are lots of things to do. These are more specific nuances, but the bigger mindset really for the DOH right now is perhaps how do we strategize and develop a pandemic emergency mode for all programs, for all functions, and for all operations so that when something extraordinary kicks in again, our programs are ready, our support systems are ready, and we just have to kind of flip the switch and still be able to cope as fast as possible. And from a more cross-sector perspective, and this is perhaps a call to action, not just for the DOH, but also for other agencies, particularly the PIDS, for continuing collaboration on long-term projections. Active sectoral recovery. So, Again, as I mentioned earlier, the pandemic really highlighted the interconnectedness of health with other sectors. So it really is about the social determinants of health. So there are lots of questions cropping up right now as we face the new normal, as we face the future. For example, as what Val mentioned earlier, what will be the health needs of children who were challenged in terms of vaccination during the time of the pandemic? What will be the changes in education and formal learning arrangements? And how will this affect knowledge development and even competitiveness and employment in the future, which spells out the socioeconomic future of households, right? How will disruptions in prices of goods in inflation paths also affect purchasing powers of households? And this is especially important for health services and health goods because inflation is much faster for this specific subset of, of goods and services. And also, how will labor-related challenges also affect productivity, food security, and health? In fact, if just looking at our program data, we saw that the consultations for mental health actually increased so much, not just because of unemployment, but also because of changes in employment arrangements. People being stuck at home, not being able to socialize, and having to really mix their resting space with their workspace is a mental challenge. So we want to be able to anticipate these problems early on and establish solutions before they even start manifesting. So it really is a, a championing of intersectoral work as we continue to move forward in addressing the challenges of COVID-19 now and even its residual effects in the future. So. Uh, again, the DOH is very much privileged for this opportunity and we hope for continuing discussions as we continue to improve the lives and health of our people. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Christian. We'll, we are also very honored to have uh, DOH with us today. Um, and we are uh, very pleased to hear about uh, your initiatives, the, the initiatives of the DOH to uh, strengthen the health system, in terms of uh, beefing, beefing up uh, our health infrastructure, increasing our human resources, uh, 
improving our primary health care uh what else uh making covid 19 um control a regular program of the doh improving procurement and other initiatives we, we will we can unpack uh and uh know about the details later on during our open forum i'm, I'm sure there will be questions for you okay thank you very much christian so at this point uh, let us hear from our um next discussant who is uh from um bill health our next discussant is dr lambert uh david who is currently the senior manager of the standards and monitoring department which is under the health finance policy sector headed by uh, Phil Health Senior Vice President, Dr. Clementine Bautista. Dr. David graduated from the Manila Central University College of Medicine. Um, he finished pediatric residency training at the National Ch Children's Hospital, worked at San Lazaro Hospital as medical officer three, and has been employed with Phil Health for 17 years. Dr. David, the floor is now yours. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Then is my slide visible? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, good afternoon uh, to all. Uh, in behalf of my uh, boss, Dr. Clem Bautista, we are very honored and privileged uh, to be invited in this activity, uh, uh, in, in which is very informative and I hope very productive uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm just, I am going to discuss uh, very briefly uh, field health and the pandemic. And at the end of my presentation, uh, I will discuss the our, our recommendation, our note observation and recommendation as re regards to the study of uh, Dr. Ulya. So, as you may know, uh, field health has been encountering many challenges for, uh, from 2020 to 2019. We have been uh, having some backlog in claims payment, uh, and there are many contributory factors regarding that. One is uh, the HR complement in field health. There are 990. Uh, personnel to process the claims of uh, nationwide from 2019 to 2021, and there are no increase in personal complement. Actually, uh, my dear uh, participants, uh, Phil uh, Health employees are not immune to COVID-19. A lot of our, our employees actually got quarantined, isolated, and several actually died. Uh, from COVID-19. And some of those that died are actually doctors. So we have doctors that died that evaluate the claim. So that so the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has really impacted field health that much, in which it uh, literally somehow uh, hindered our operational capacity to give to give uh, service uh, to our providers. Now, as you can see in this slide also, uh, the number of claims we are receiving is increasing. So with regards to the earlier statement of Dr. Olep, I think uh, he was referring to the top 12 or the most commonly claimed or the top 12 burden of diseases and the most commonly claimed uh, uh, procedure, surgical procedure. But as you can see, if when you take the whole universe of uh, claims, it's increasing. So as you can see, from 2020 to 2021, uh, we're, we're just uh, August, this was taken last August, and there's actually 26%, a 26% in daily claims received. So that's how, that's the workload increase, uh, the number of uh, claims load that is increasing yearly. Uh, that is being submitted to field health. So in this slide, it will show you uh, during the pandemic years, 
uh, the percent of how, how many percent are COVID claims and how many percent are non-COVID claims. Still, as you can see, uh, majority are non-COVID claims uh, and only 19% are COVID claims. But there's a certain pattern that we have observed that I fail to reflect it here, uh, especially in National Capital Region, in which uh, majority of our COVID cases are concentrated. The claims for other conditions like what uh, Dr. Olip says the top 12 burden of disease actually decrease or decreasing in national COVID, uh, in NCR, but the number of COVID cases are actually the highest uh, nationwide. So there's a the statement of Dr. Olip regarding the decrease uh, of uh, claims or hospitalization for uh, for the burden of disease might not apply nationwide, but actually apply on a region basis, more, most likely to the national capital region. So this is just to show that PhilHealth is obligated to, of course, by law, to, to uh, provide financing uh, as, as, the, as mandated by the UHC that individual-based health services shall be financed primarily through prepayment. Now, as you can see, uh, it, this is the, these are the significant timeline in which regard, uh, with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. So January 30, this is when the WHO declared the public health emergency. And March 9 is the proclamation of the state of national public health emergency. And on March 11, the, the WHO declared the pandemic. March 16, this is the start of the ECQ. And of course, March 24, Bayanihan to heal at to heal as one. And of course, Bayanihan 2 came afterwards. So as under section four, if Bayanihan to heal as one, it direct field health to show their own medical expense to public and private healthcare workers in case of exposure to COVID-19 or only or any work-related injury or disease during the duration of the emergency. This is just one of the uh, one of the pertinent provision that I will discuss later. Uh, so these are the drivers that increase the cost, uh, extended length of stay. With COVID nineteen, it's it started with fourteen days uh, confinement. The medicines are expensive. The PPEs, the pro personal protective equipment, and the illness that leads to ARDS, management by specialization not included in the guidelines, and ECMO and renal therapy. So these are the drivers that increase the cost uh, in paying for COVID-19. And the objective of field health uh, to, with regards to the COVID-19 are provide ample coverage for all Filipinos for essential health services needed to manage COVID-19 patients, benefit coverage for the spectrum of care for coronavi coronavirus disease based on syst systematic and evidence-based process that includes appropriate costing, and uphold our mandate of providing financial risk protection. So I'm just going to discuss those uh, significant, uh, let's say, let's say, uh, significant packages that uh, that greatly contributed to the uh, uh, alleviating the burden of the COVID-19 pandemic to our uh, members. So one of those packages or policies is the inpatient management of probable and confirmed COVID-19 cases, developing severe illness and outcomes. This is circular 2020-0009. The scope of this is all Filipinos conf confined as probable or confirmed cases of COVID-19 are can avail of this package. Fail health accredited health providers with capacity to provide inpatient case management for these cases. Now the services required by Fail Health are the following: the complete services or minimum standards. Of course, accommodation, management and monitoring, 
laboratory imaging, the medicine, supply, and equipment. Now, additional medical services for cases that develop or impending severe illness, which includes but not limited to the following, shall be covered by the package like ARDS, acute respiratory disease uh, distress syndrome, septic shock, requiring in invasive ventilation, requiring ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and requiring renal replacement therapy. So next is the full financial risk protection for Filipino health workers and patients against COVID-19. Now, this, this package, unlike the previous one, the previous package for inpatient, uh, there are package schedule in which how much PhilHealth would pay. But, the, but this second policy that I'm discussing is for uh, health workers, there's no package, there's no cap. Whatever the expense of the health worker during the confinement, we will pay all the expenses for health worker. So we have defined the health workers as persons engaged in health and health-related work regardless of employment status, which includes doctors, nurses, allied health professional, admin and supports personnel in health facilities, utility and security personnel in health facilities, health volunteers deployed in health facilities, staff and personal working in government health agencies. So all staff personnel working in government health agencies, regardless of employment, shall be eligible for the same benefit as health workers. Full financial risk protection shall be provided to all public and private health workers for medical expenses or, or, or any work-related injury or disease during the, the duration of the national state of emergency. All items donated by third party shall not be charged to the patient. So these are the schedules, the, the amounts, and these are the other packages that we have. The COVID-19 testing, uh, we have three packages. If all the services are given, it's 3,409. If the test kits are donated, it's 2,077. If the test kits and the lab, lab is subsidized by the government, 901. So these are for testing. And we also have a benefit package for community isolation at 22,449. So these are our reaction and comments. So there's actually, Dr. Ulip is correct, there's a decreased utilization of health services and corresponding packages during COVID-19 pandemic in some region, but not all. What was emphasized are the services and benefit delivered in primary care le level, like TB dots, HIV screening, and prenatal checkup. It would be interesting to know if the emergency procedures as, such as appendectomy, trauma surgery, follow the same pattern. Uh, number three, the reason were demands, demand side and supply side issue. Policies to be formulated should not only come from the health sector, should involve other sectors. And of also in the last, we should also consider the negative effect on the behavior of healthcare providers during the pandemic. Example of these are exorbitant professional fee and hospital charges for patients with COVID or non-COVID during the pandemic. We have noted an in exorbitant increase in the uh, PF and hospital charges in several uh, and being declared also by some local chief executive, which we are now investigating. In other, other more notes, uh, with Dr. Olaf's declaration regarding the decrease of utilization of a sponsor in indigent patient, I think it's not that uh, uh, significant because I look at the data uh, for sponsored indigent and NHTS, there are uh, for 2020, 2020, it's 3,192,479. In 2019, it's 3,486,333. So I, there's an actual decrease, but it's not that uh, significant or large to say that uh, the indigents were not, or sponsored member of PhilHeart have not, have not uh, there's, a, there's a really, uh, significant decrease in their health utilization. Other uh, comments are, 
the integrated primary care. Yes, we are now studying the primary care provider, uh, primary care provider net network, the PCPN for the consulta. Next is we also agree on the EMR that we really that will really help us in the processing of claims. And lastly, uh, regarding to the telemedicine, we are now studying regarding telemedicine because telemedicine actually is a tool being used for consultation. So it's part of the package. And, and uh, we're still determining if we will need to be to develop a package for such uh, telemedicine as a whole because consultation actually is uh, part of the package that we are given. So with that, thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, David. Thank you for um, clarifying um, your clarification of, of uh, um, some of the uh, data uh, presented, uh, part, uh, such as on the, uh, the claims, and um, as well as telling us about uh, the initiatives of um, PhilHealth. Okay, so we'll now proceed with the open forum, but before we start entertaining questions, May I uh, ask uh, our presenter, Dr. Uh, Val Ulep, if he would like to respond to uh, some of the things, particularly those mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lambert David uh, Val, would you have anything to say, um, such as on um, on the the increase in the field health claims, but in your study? But I think in your study you were you were referring to the uh, high disease burden, or in you so um, um, sort of a decline. No, you may want to uh, yes. Yes. yes, please, Val. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Yes, um, I think it would be as you've said, we've uh, analyzed only selected conditions. That's right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, um, uh, it might be a different picture when you look at other uh, other claims, right? But it, it would be very interesting to um, to um, examine again the data. So the mm -hmm. data that we use came from PhilHealth. So um, that that would be interesting to to reanalyze and look at other, look at also other claims, right? So I've mentioned uh, appendectomy cases That's right. uh, mm -hmm. and other uh, procedures. That would also be interesting to to see, especially mm -hmm. when you want to. Uh, assess the behavior of providers, whether there was mm -hmm. changes during the pandemic. So, mm -hmm. and you all know that appendectomy and other procedures are very prone to these changes, right? So, yeah, again, uh, we at PIDS um, would be very interested to collaborate with PhilHealth. That's right. Uh, in further mm -hmm. assessing uh, the claims data and other, you know, um, uh, data set of PhilHealth that will inform policy. Uh, mm -hmm. Both and even the their data set on the indigent population, no? Yeah. That would be yeah. very um, interesting to, to see. Thank you. And to, and Thanks, to Dr. David. Thank you for, for that comment. Okay. Okay, friends. Uh, before we uh, let our speakers answer questions uh, from our participants, let us um, give them uh, some time to breathe, no? So let us have a poll. So in this uh, poll, all our WebEx participants are, are uh, welcome to, to join. So here is our poll question for this week. So from among those who will answer this question correctly, we will pick three names who will each get a PIDS notebook. So I got this question from the presentation of Dr. Val Ulep. Okay, so here is the question. Based on Dr. Ulep's estimates, how much are the long-term costs from productivity losses due to the direct and indirect health impacts of COVID-19? Is it A, 1.5 billion, B, 4.6 trillion, or C, 2.3 trillion? Okay, you may um, select you may select from A, A, B, or C, and please uh, answer now as we will be uh, closing the poll in a few seconds. Okay. Okay, so Gwen? Yes, I'm closing the poll now. 
Okay, and I think you need um, Webex needs at least 10 seconds ba to uh, process the results. Yes, uh, 10 more seconds. Okay. So friends, if you have questions for our speakers, just use the chat box. And for those who are watching us on Facebook, uh, feel free to use the comment section on Facebook. Okay, so do we have the results? Okay, so what is the correct answer? It's letter C. And uh, okay, 39 got it right. So as I, as I have said, we will select three names from the 33 uh, participants who answered our the question correctly and we will announce the names of our winners before we uh after the open forum okay so friends at this point uh i now uh i invite all our speakers dr ulet mr nuevo and dr david to join the panel okay so let us let me go to our shot box okay um this one is from cecilia francisco uh and her question is there was a decrease in birth rate in 2020 does this support decrease hospital admission related to deliveries uh who may want to uh, answer this uh val any insight would you have any response to this question i will also ask a yeah. uh, question Yes. Yeah, I think there there was some there was a, a news on the declining birth rate, but again, mm -hmm. to be honest, I don't want to speculate on, on right. why there was mm -hmm. a de decrease. But you know, a possible reason is the de declining income, etc. Right? So um, we don't know. In other countries, they've seen increase in unwanted pregnancy, so there might be huge variation across countries. But um, mm -mm. yeah, so I cannot fully explain the cause of that decline in birth rate. It, it's okay. Okay. Uh, Christian, um, would you have anything to, to say regarding this question? Actually, I support what uh, Dr. Ulib said. It's a little difficult to speculate, especially right. since births and deliveries are kind of driven by multiple factors. But mm. it is a very important inquiry so that in the future, should we come face to face with an, a circumstance like this again, we are able to mitigate the difficulties um, and, and make sure that we give proper avenues and opportunities for healthcare um, for our mothers. Yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, let's go to uh, the next question. And this one is from Mr. Uh, Fu, Fu Hui, uh, who is an employment specialist from the International Labor Organization. Are there any points you can share about the impact of COVID on mental health and well-being in the Philippines, especially um with regards to lockdown restrictions work from home orders teleworking and shifting work-life balance um christian would you have um any insights about uh this uh question uh Impact yes of covid so, yes yes please go so ahead actually, based on our program data for mental health so there were increases in the number of total calls in our national center for mental health out uh, hotline okay. there were increases in that um even increases in suicide related calls um i guess that's a little more extreme in terms of manifestation um in some of the studies there were also reports of uh, moderate to severe anxiety moderate mm -hmm. to severe depression encountered by certain individuals primarily especially at the start when things were really very new and we haven't really gone into our rhythm of coping into the new situation yet so a lot of those anxieties also kicked in but um I guess that's as far as I am knowledgeable of in terms of mm -hmm. what impact has been detected by our uh, program here at the DOH, but I'm sure there's plenty more that probably has to be surfaced. Thank you, uh, Christian. Uh, Val? I agree with with with, with, uh, with, with Ian. So, um, there is actually an increase according to the department of, department of health program data there is really an increase in the number of calls but again it's really hard to disaggregate what's actually causing that that increase in mental incidents in mental health right so 
uh, again, it's really hard to speculate. Is it driven by employment, the lack of employment, or the lack of income, or the lack of work from home arrangement, etc.? So that would be a very interesting to to conduct a, a more in-depth analysis. What's actually driving uh, the increase in incidents in mental health, particularly among the younger um, age group, right? Um, so yeah. Yeah. It's a very important problem. It's, it's uh, you know, mental health is one of the um, high burden conditions uh, yes. that needs to be addressed. Um, and and so I think Abal, you mentioned in your presentation that that would be one of the causes for the increase in excess uh, mortality yeah, yeah. in 2021 so, relative to 2020. Yeah, yeah so okay. I, I, actually this was reported by uh, Seth Carl and one of the if you look at the major causes or the causes of death in 2020, uh, the, uh, one of the conspicuous uh, conditions that, uh, 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 or one of the the, the cases, the, the the diseases that uh, increase uh, uh, in, in in terms of mortality is actually mental health. So yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess just to add as an additional insight, again it's yes, an insight. Please. I don't have the answer to it. Also, maybe. It's it's also going to be interesting and important to look into mental health effects to COVID patients specifically, okay. especially having undergone through um, the perils of the disease, the stigma behind it, and also the uh, post-recovery matters that they had to deal with. So the, a very specific element to mental health that probably merits some, some attention as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before I uh, uh, throw some questions to Dr. Uh, David, um, you guys mentioned about uh, uh, decreased uh, hospital visits. I think that was uh, Val, that was in, in, in one of your slides, I think. But uh, yeah, considering that uh, teleconsult has, uh, has been gaining ground no? uh, during this, this pandemic, so um, do the data reflect physical visits only? Be, na, how about teleconsult? These are, you know, yeah. virtual interaction between the patient and the and the doctor. And I, I was wondering if this has been, you know, the number of teleconsult uh, interactions, no? Are, are, because this also can, can be considered as, uh, you know, if I form up a visit to the hospital, though virtual. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. You're right, Michelle. So, um, Sheila. unfortunately, our data uh, does not capture um, um, online consultations or online uh, uh, or telemedicine, right? So it was not captured. But again, there is really an increase in 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 the number of online consultations. For example, there is more than hundred percent increase in the revenue of one of the biggest telemedicine um, services. So, but again, um, the number of, of, or the magnitude of online consultation might not, but we need to understand further the, the magnitude of that. And obviously it's related to quality, it's related to financing because we don't have yet solid policies on how do we actually pay for telemedicine. And again, right. when we pay, pay for it on out, uh, out of pocket out of basis. Pocket that's then. also mm -hmm. a restriction for uh, the more that's right. kind of for the poorest mm -hmm. segments of the society, and only the rich can actually access those kinds of services, right? Mm -hmm. So even though there is actually an increase, it might not be significant among mm -hmm. the poorer segment um, um, who relies on you know, social protections like PhilHealth and other um, and other uh, 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 social protection schemes. So. Yeah, it needs to be further studied the magnitude uh, of that and the quality related to telemedicine, etc. It, it's still a new field, and, um, mm -hmm. and I hope we can f further study uh, the impact of telemedicine um, in, in the succeeding years. Right. So, yeah. thank you very much, Val. And it's good that Phil Health has, you know, in one of its uh, plans. Uh, I think Dr. David, you mentioned this that uh, you have this plan of integrating uh, telemedicine. In uh, um, making it part of the package of your of of um, package of uh, health services, sir. Ah, uh, yeah, we are considering. Actually, it's part of the home isolation package, the telemedicine. Mm -mm. But paying for telemedicine separately, okay. we're still studying that because it's 
it's a process, it's a tool for, it's consultation, and we pay for the whole services. So it's actually being studied on whether or not can we pay for telemedicine as a, uh, alone. alone. But we're actually uh, accepting telemedicine in home isolation for COVID-19. Okay, so right now it's only for COVID-19, sir. In home isolation. Package. Home isolation. Okay. Um, Dr. David, I have uh, some questions here for you. Uh, this one is from, uh, okay. Uh, what are the reasons why healthcare workers who are only on home quarantine not covered even when they are incurring expenses for medicines and disinfectant sanitizers? needed while on home quarantine this is a question that uh from from our uh, web one of our web participants sir you may want to clarify this yeah, yeah. If, okay if, yes previously we don't pay for home quarantine but we just released a circular this year uh for home isolation so we have a package for home isolation i will just Place it in the chat box, the, num the circular number. Okay. But there's already, there's already a, a, a policy that we will pay for home isolation, not only healthcare, healthcare workers, but to any member. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. David, here's another question for you. This is from um, Dr. Sunny Africa of Ebon Foundation. How many COVID-19 claims did PhilHealth receive and how many were paid? since the start of the pandemic? And uh, how about for non-COVID-19 claims? Well, for now, let me see my date. Uh, uh, 2020, wait. For 2020, we, I have data here for 2020. Uh, for non-COVID claims, we mm -hmm. have paid Ninety-three million seven hundred nine. Uh, Ninety-three billion. Um, That's for uh, COVID claims. Non-COVID, non-COVID. Ah, Na, uh, sorry, non-COVID. Non-COVID okay. claim ninety-three billion seven hundred seven hundred ninety-three million three hundred seventy-four thousand five hundred eighty-four. For COVID-related claims, two billion one million two ninety-seven two five seven. Pesos. So that's for 2020. I have no, for, but for 2021, I apologize because we still, I have no data with regards to the 2021. But for 2020, actually, it's posted in our website. Okay. Anyone can uh, look at our data. Yeah, so those are the data on COVID and non-COVID claims for 2020. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. David. Okay, uh, from the same uh, participant from still from Dr. Sunny Africa, and this one is for you, Dr. Ule. Um, hmm. Okay, there are. Um, thank you for quantifying what has been anecdotal for so long. There are so, also many okay. anecdotes of hospital-based healthcare yes, being more expensive. Any aggregate observation on this? Can you repeat that again? Okay. Um, anecdotes. He said that there also have been anecdotes on, of hospital-based healthcare being more expensive during this pandemic. And would you have any observation or any data on this? Um, yeah, a lot of anecdotes on that because of the the reduction in supply, right? So you ex mm -mm. so you expect the prices of several of some healthcare services will increase. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have information on that, um, um, but we are trying to study um, hospital financing, but it's not, it's a different, different study, right? So mm -hmm. we'll try to look into that possibility, but going back to the question, we don't have any information, but there are, agree, there are anecdotes on the increasing, uh, um, you know, um, uh, costs because maybe of the dwindling supply, right? Okay. Thank you, uh, Val. Uh, Christian, would you have, have anything to say about uh, this question? Any, would you have a uh, general but, observation? I, Ms. Sheila, I think it's also important for, 
maybe PhilHealth to address that if there is overpayments um, during the pandemic. So if they actually monitor um, uh, the claims, right, they should be able to kind of understand whether there is overpayments or um, they are, if some hospitals are paying um, beyond what is expected, etc. So I'm not sure if Dr. David could prov oh. uh, provide some insights to yes. this. Okay, and of course, Ian. Okay. If, I don't know, Ian, maybe you have also observations. Before I go to Dr. David and ask if he has seen this in, in, in the data of PhilHealth, uh, may we hear from Christian? Yeah, actually, yeah, we're familiar with uh, with the anecdotes, and definitely, I think as hospitals also struggle with um, financing operations, um, there is some, I guess, understandability to possibilities of increasing prices. But I think for us here at the DOH, it we don't really have existing mechanisms or platforms to really monitor prices of hospitals as they relate to delivery of inpatient services. Um, theoretically, Philip might be able to trace this, but then again, it's also really a function of how well reported or how accurately reported these prices are by the facilities when they submit their claims. Um, and historically, I think that, that has also been one of the challenges of PhilHealth, but maybe with uh, recent developments, they have found ways. So um, unfortunately, I also, have, I also don't have any information on hand, but definitely the, the, the possibility of it is, is, is really there. Thank you, Christian. Dr. David? Would you like to comment on this, sir? Yes. Would you have any data? Um, Ma'am Sheila, can I comment uh, later? Yes, yeah, sure, there's, sir. I'm, there's, I'm attending two meetings. Oh, if you can, I see. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll answer immediately. Once, mm -mm, no. uh, I'll answer later. It's, it's okay, sir. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we'll just go to uh, another question and then we can come back to you when, you, when you're ready, sir. Okay. Okay, uh, we have a question from Dr. Aleli Kraft, the UP School of Economics. Uh, could a decrease in consultations or claims be also due to reductions in disease incidence itself? Mobility restrictions could have also reduced the risk of transmission of other diseases. Would there be ways to account for this, for these in your estimates of losses? Um, Val? That's actually a very good uh, comment from Dr. Aleli. Um, but yes, I agree there are several conditions that, that I mean, the incidence of several uh, diseases or conditions actually declined during the pandemic, like wash-related conditions like uh, diarrhea or pneumonia, uh, because, yeah, because of uh, the uh, decrease in contact, right? So you would see the decrease in incidence. Uh, but yeah, um, well, unfortunately, we did not take into account in the estimation of costs. Um, uh, that would maybe a second. That may, might might be another extension of the study and how to adjust the cost because of the declining uh, incidence of diseases. But I, I agree, there are several um, uh, conditions that actually declined during the pandemic. Some, like for example, uh, neglected tropical diseases, uh, there is actually decline. Wash. Uh, diseases like uh, diarrhea or pneumonia. So, yeah, that's a very, very good question. But unfortunately, wala po <laughs> sa, uh, uh, po namin sinama sa analysis. But we'll, okay. in, to to, we'll, we'll include that po in the, maybe in the caveat of the study. So. Thank you very much, Val. Okay, let's uh, have... Um... Another question, okay, this one is from Maria Lourdes, who is one of our Facebook participants. And um, may I request a question to answer this because this was part of your uh, comments, no? Uh, how do we ensure accuracy and timeliness of health or disease information and statistics from all hospitals to a centralized DOH database? You mentioned in your uh, comments, uh, that one of the initiatives of uh, the DOH was uh, improving your uh, uh, information systems. Christian? Mm, yeah, so definitely one of the, I guess, bolder visions of the agency really is to move towards 
line listing because right now the way we collect information is it goes through several layers of governance from the facility especially in the public sector from the facility up to the municipality or the city consolidated at the province the region before it gets up to the doh and usually along those lines the information gets aggregated so it's, it becomes more difficult to disaggregate and really see patterns based on very specific variables. So that move towards line listing and maybe getting information straight from facilities um, is probably a, a good way to go, right? I think that's something we can all agree with. But I suppose the bigger challenge that we are really facing right now is establishing the interoperability of that mechanism. That's right. Because currently, um, we understand that at the DOH, our role really should be setting standards for information systems and variables that should be collected and just creating the pathway for all types of systems to actually be able to talk to each other, right? Our information pathway. But there are certain shifts that also has to happen. Uh, currently, the DOH is still invested in activities for provision of hardware support in certain areas and a lot of that has to shift towards more standards and policy setting and even at the at the front of our service providers not all of them are it enabled just yet or even for some who are the it systems are still very rudimentary so there also has to be some evolution to that and this is where we actually want to look into the possibility of partnering with other agencies such as the dict Right. How do we how do we mobilize resources um, to allow our providers, our LGUs, to invest more in in information systems? Uh, actually, I I would like to link this to the question earlier on telemedicine to Doctor David. Right. So uh, it has always been a floated idea for PhilHealth to pay for telemedicine, but when discussions around that happen, it always goes back to the point of using PhilHealth money to invest in IT infrastructure, which is possible, but at the same time, the question there is, what really is the purpose of the PhilHealth payment? Is it to finance these mm -hmm. infrastructural activities or more from the perspective of using telemedicine to deliver the service, mm -hmm. right? Because those are two different schools of thoughts resulting to do two very different estimates and also financial burden. So um, if we look at the UHC Act, actually um, those things are probably not within the responsibility of PhilHealth, right? Maybe that's something that the central agency or the LGUs or even our partner national government agencies such as the DICT should be looking into and really pouring in investment. So part of it also is the governance backbone mm -hmm. to things to make sure we are accountable to moving all relevant parts. So honestly, it's definitely a long way to go, but rest assured that there is a visioning also that's happening within the agency. Thank you very much, Christian. I saw uh, Dr. Ulip nodding his head. Uh, would you have anything to say, Val? Uh <laughs> no, I agree, with, uh, I agree with Ian, like he articulates um, <laughs> The, the the how do you call it the plan of the UH so well so <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you for that okay oh dr david is already here sir are you ready sir yes uh what's the first question okay uh before you go to that question because i i still have i uh i'd like to uh review um um uh, the questions that i asked of you a while ago perhaps you can you can answer this first from shelly and samoy why did the phil help made a classification that mild covid patients who are not senior citizens or without comorbidity cannot claim an, any benefit from phil health uh that because uh, we based our package uh, based on Bayanihan one, uh, we should we should base our package uh, based on WHO uh, protocol on COVID, and also the DOH re released a department circular adopting the PISMID guidelines on case categorization of COVID patients. 
So, nakalagay po kasi doon what are the mild, moderate, severe. So, yun po yung ginamit namin guide on what we will pay, what uh, what are the, what will be compensable for inpatient and what will be compensable for isolation. Kasi po, uh, like for example, we don't want to overburden the hospital with asymptomatic, uh, no symptoms, uh, uh, patient, but th while those who are severe and critical are in the emergency room or in the tents, that's what happened in the, pre in the previous surge. We want to actually put those patients in the correct facilities. For example, a symptomatic or a symptomatic patient but COVID positive, ready for home isolation or a quarantine facility. But for those with symptoms, uh, moderate to severe to critical, they will be the one uh, admitted into the hospitals. So that's why we released the home isolation uh, package for COVID. So for those that have mild, uh, no symptoms or mild symptoms, but are positive. So uh, thank you, Bo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. David. Um, this was the early earlier questions, I think, from the same person. Uh, Okay, but th this was related to her uh, second question. Oh, I think yun na nga yun. Oh, oh. Ang question niya kanina was, why did the PhilHealth make, change or made a classification when it comes to PhilHealth benefits for COVID-19 patients? Okay. Uh -huh. Let's go to the other... Question. Okay. I w I'm just uh, uh, reviewing uh, the chat box. Uh, Mom Sheila, how about regarding the inflation? I, I did not get it. Okay, sir. Uh, hold on, sir. Okay. We'll, we'll go back to that, sir. Uh, Please, uh, I was, uh, I am looking at that question in, on the chat box. We can go back to that, sir. Okay. Um, other questions? Let me check. Uh, well, probably you can, um, we, we can go back to your data on the excess uh, deaths or excess mortality, you know. Um, kasi what you mentioned was um, one of the possible causes of the excess of the increase of excess deaths in 2021 was um, uh, will be mental health cases, no? But how about other non-COVID related cases, no? Which uh, in which the services in which um, you know will can be better absorbed by our hospitals given our decreasing number of positive COVID cases um, this year. No, we are already seeing that. So would that would it not constitute um, you know lesser excess COVID excess uh, deaths for 2021? given that our hospitals can already absorb those non-COVID related diseases? Hi, Mami Shilay. Um, regarding diseases, I need to check kung, parang what are other conditions or other diseases that might, you know, add to the excess death. But as I've said, uh, yung talagang very conspicuous is mental health. There is like increase in cardiovascular death. There's um, decline in cases in some infectious diseases. But again, I, we need to further study kung what will what conditions be, uh, would account for for that excess death. But again, mm -hmm. yung, I think one of the conditions talaga is actually mental health. But mental health talaga. Uh, but you know, we, we need to to do more digging on the data so we can actually add. add um, understand ano talaga yung nag increase na conditions right okay yeah thank you thank you for that uh, okay dr david um has just typed 
the uh, the name of the uh, yung, yung circular na sinasabi niya kanina. So thank you for that, sir. Let's uh, go to another question. This time is for this is from Lailani Bernadette Cabras to Dr. David. Um, included in the issues mentioned is the practice of charging exorbitant professional fees and categorizing non-COVID cases to COVID. Are there measures in place to monitor such, and how does the institution or how does Phil Health address these matters? Yes, uh, actually, that's why we detected it. We are vig very vigilant in monitoring such uh, practice because actually uh, hospital submits uh, their statement of account. So that's where we realize the, break the breakdown of the professional fees and the hospital fees. And we compare that with the DOH policy on the SRP, or suggested retail price. DOH has released that uh, policy. I forgot the, uh, the number, but we used we used that as a reference to consider whether uh, the prices, for example, of medicines or equipments, medical equipments, are exorbitant. With professional fees, we have we are monitoring that constantly. It's not only with COVID claims, actually. It's with also with non-COVID claim mm -hmm. because I don't know why. What's the behavior? What what made this happen? There are hospitals in the provinces, for example, appendectomy, are actually charging the patient, uh, the PF and the hospital charges, uh, how does the same amount in which a private tertiary hospital in the natural capital region charges? So that's a level one. So when, when, when you compare their previous amount or previous claim, it's not that uh, big. So there are, during the pandemic, there was a negative uh, inflationary effect on the professional fee mm -hmm. and the uh, hospital fees. So that's one of our uh, observation. Uh, of course, with regards to the hospital fee, uh, there's a DOH uh, policy regarding that. So we, we will, one is we will file uh, a case against them our, because of our quasi-judicial function. And we will also refer them to DOH for violating uh, the, the, the circular that DOH released on suggested retail price. Uh, that's, that's all, but we're very vigilant. We're using both electronic or IT monitoring system and manual, our field personnel are conducting uh, visits in the hospitals and also domiciliary me members. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. David. Um, let me just check if we have other questions from Facebook. I think we've already covered um, the questions on Facebook. And um, a while ago, sir, there was a question. You, you, you have already answered it, the number of COVID uh, versus non-COVID claims. That was the question of Dr. Um, Sunny Africa that uh, you have already uh, answered it. Okay, um, no questions. Uh, let me just check our, I think we've already covered everything. So at this point, um, may I uh, ask our, um, our speakers for their for their brief final remarks. They may, you may have um, additional words, additional uh, remarks to say to our audience. This is your chance. Uh, let me start with Val. Then uh, I think it, yeah yeah yes. Thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, for attending this uh, uh, this uh, public seminar. I also want to thank Ian for. Uh, articulating all the bold reforms that um, DOH is trying to do in, in the medium to long term. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about these uh, new development, developments in DOH. And of course, uh, with Dr. David for, uh, for some of your comments, uh, for your uh, insightful comments, um, at PIDS I always <laughs> I always offer ourselves to 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 
to feel health, to look more into the data, to uh, basically you can use us <laughs> to analyze your data and we can um, um, produce more uh, uh, reports that will actually inform um, um, health financing uh, um, um, policies uh, in the medium to long term. So, yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I want to thank uh, also um, uh, the team of Mam Sheila for, for mounting this event. So, thank you. We're more than happy to uh, host you to organize this webinar for you, Val. Because uh, I, I, I think, as I've said, this is a seminal study that ought to be uh, shared with, with the public. No? You gave us really uh, new insights into the uh, direct and uh, indirect effects of the pandemic. So keep it up and uh, more uh, studies <laughs> to come. <laughs> we expect more studies uh, from you. Not just about COVID-19. Yeah, we need more energy. <laughs> need more energy. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's hear from uh, uh, Mr. Christian Nuevo uh, from the DOH. We're very happy that uh, you had the opportunity to attend this uh, uh, webinar, Christian. Yeah, I think I just wanted to go back to one of the slides of Dr. Ulep earlier about how frail health systems really are mostly challenged uh, because of the pandemic. And I think for us here in the Philippines, for quite some time, we have probably just thought our health system was doing okay. But with the onset of the pandemic, it really revealed a lot of the very, very visceral weaknesses of the sector in the system. And it was inescapable because um, the, the pandemic really was, was very, very strong in terms of its effect in the sector. So. Um, I, I, I am not here to, to kind of pad through the bad things that have happened with the pandemic, but at the same time, maybe this is an opportunity for us to really push for the reforms that we want, right? It's the opportunity to kind of strike while the iron is hot. Now that health really is a huge consideration of the entire sector and is on huge demand from everyone, from all Filipinos, it's our time to push for more resources, to push for better services and better systems. So it's also an opportunity for institutions Institutions like the DOH, like PhilHealth and our LGUs to really integrate and to move towards better platforms. So actually, uh, I, I got some feedback from our partner office here at the DOH in terms of integrating our information systems. Work has already started in standardizing um, and harmonizing health and health-related data which is the very, very core of being able to make health systems, health information systems interoperable. So it really is an opportunity to probably propel us for, uh, faster to the reforms that we want. We just have to be smart about it and we just have to be collaborative about it with other agencies. So thank you very much for allowing us these platforms to, to talk and to discuss and to be challenged as well, because definitely that's, that's going to uh, make our future decisions even better. So thank you very much again to PIDS to, and to all those who attended. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Christian Nuevo of uh, the DOH. And of course, last but not the least, Dr. David Lambert. Dr. Lambert David, sir. Yes, thank you very much. I want to apologize of me going in and out. I am also attending another very important meeting. It's okay, sir. Yeah. It's okay. Uh -huh. And I'm also on the chopping block on the other meeting. So uh, thank you for this study. Actually, I've learned so much uh, from this study also. And I hope there will be more like this in the future, like what Dr. Olip said. I hope there will be more collaboration between uh, PIDS and PhilHealth because we have so many data with regards to claims, uh, uh, disease condition, and it's a great, uh, good avenue for studying research with regards to health impacts of, uh, health help impact research of programs. So thank you very much for this opportunity and God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David. Friends, um, 
Please join me in thanking Dr. Val Ulet, Mr. Christian Nueva, and Dr. Lambert David for their valuable insights. Let us give all of them a well-deserved big virtual clap. And we hope that this webinar has given everyone greater clarity of the health, health impacts of COVID-19 and the measures that uh, uh, need to be implemented to strengthen our health system. So before we finally close, I'd like to announce the winners of our uh, poll, um, Hiron Uy, Amelu Gadwem, Gadwena, and Gladys Fortes. Okay, Hiron Uy, Amelu Gadwena, and Gladys Fortes, uh, you won in our uh, poll uh, for this webinar. So the webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. Okay, so, okay, we have uh, some final reminders before we uh, close this webinar. So you can access all the presentations from today's webinar from the PADS website. And flash on the screen also is the link to the full study, which you can download from the PADS website, the full study of Dr. Val Ulet. Okay, please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. Your comments are important uh, for us to, um, important to us to improve our webinars. Please also regularly visit our uh, website and social media pages. And again, our uh, sincerest thanks to our Facebook uh, viewers um, and also those who tune in to our Twitter, Twitter account for the uh, live, live updates of this webinar. Okay, so we have one more week left uh, this November and flash on the screen is our webinar on Thursday. It's on assessing the Philippines performance in meeting the ASEAN Economic Community Vision 2025. So we hope to see you again next week. Okay, and finally, we would like to thank, we'd like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, um, academia, civil society, business and international development community who join us today. Maraming maraming salamat po. The names of these agencies of these institutions are flashed on the screen. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, next week. Okay, so this concludes our webinar. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the rest of your day. See you. Bye-bye.